So just to be clear, I've made this video earlier, put it up, but I wasn't satisfied with the outcome, so I've decided to do it again. And I'm doing this particular version of it, a landscape as, a pulse, as opposed to portrait, where the uh, video, sorry, the iPad would uh, be upright. So now it's sort of lying down horizontally. So that's what we're gonna do. I thought it would have been better to do it that way for the text, but you know what? I just wasn't satisfied with the whole video. So we're gonna do it again. And we're using a book called A Cultural History, Boxing, A Cultural History, written by Cassia Bodhi. So we're going to uh, start from page 31, all right? Very early on, but before I go to the uh, part that I'd like to start from, which is that what I'm going to do is show you where the chapter itself begins and it starts here. Let's try and get, let's get it right. The tinkering is a bit of a pain, but you know, it's all worth it if we do it right. So there you go. Let's zoom in a little bit. So the, the title of the chapter, as you can see, The English Golden Age. Now, honestly, it goes into, uh, it goes into, it, it begins very early on and talks about some people like Samuel Pepys, for example, and uh, talks about 1681, which you probably see around, where was it, where's 1681 again? You know what I mean? Forgive me. I always lose. Well, you can see Samuel Pepys anyway. You see Samuel Pepys. If you look at the, if you're looking at the text right now, you can see Samuel Pepys right there. And then there's something to do with 1681, which is right about where was it again? There. Okay. All right. The text is actually quite small. Unless I zoom in, see how small it is. So there you go. So it talks about the origins of that type of fighting that could be linked to boxing in the very early stages um, of the 17th century. But it talks about from the 1600s to the 1800s, basically, where, you know, boxing, a form of boxing was taking place. When we get to around 1723, then you start seeing the type of boxing that we have today coming into its own. And that's what we're going to deal with because we're going to look at how boxing gloves were introduced into the sport of boxing by a guy by the name of John Broughton. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So, here we are. We start around here. And what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to zoom in so we can get Yes. So I can even probably, I can even read it this way. All right, so it says, boxing began to flourish in the early 18th century at the expense of other sports such as quarterstaff and back sword by attracting the support of the wealthy and powerful. In 1723, a ring was erected in Hyde Park by order of His Majesty George I and the next champion of note, a former Thames waterman called John Broughton, secured the patronage of the Duke of Cumberland. The early patrons supported their fighters in training and waged huge sums on their fighters, on their fights, forgive me. The Gentleman's Magazine reported in one instance that many thousands depended on the outcome of a fight. Without the 18th century love of gambling, argues Dennis Brailsford, pugilism would have been unthinkable. And with large bets came a need for rules to limit disputes. The great enlightenment project of systemization and lawmaking thus extended to pugilism, with the first written rules of prize fighting published under John Broughton's name in 1743. As you can see there, that's where I'm at. In 1743. Although the rules were intended simply to regulate his own establishment, his own establishment. They were soon widely adopted. No one sport claims Brailsford, Brailsford owed more to its beginnings to one man 
than boxing owed to him. That's John Bratton. The rules specified how a round would begin and end, how the seconds and umpires should conduct themselves, how the money should be divided, and that a fight was over when one man could not be brought back to the scratch line in the center of the ring. That's where you get the term up to scratch from, from boxing. After 1746, English gamblers adapted the notion of, I'm gonna to have to zoom out a bit, I think, but not necessarily too much. Horse, let, let, let's get the illustration anyway before we get any further. You can see the illustration, but let's read it anyway. As horse, horse handicapping and began dividing boxers into light, middle and heavyweight classes. That's where weight classes come from. Okay. There was, there was, however, only one champion who tended to be the heaviest. There was, however, only one champion who tended to be the heaviest. So prior to that, before you could have champions in all these tools, divisions, dividing boxers into light, middle, and heavyweight, it didn't matter whether you fought in those other classes. There was only one champion. That one champion was in heavyweight. That's why people tend to hold the heavyweight division in such a veneration, so to speak. By 1838, these rules had developed into the 29 English prize ring rules. Wrestling holes such as the cross buttocks remain a part of boxing until the Queensbury rules abolished them in the 1860s. Champion from 1734 to 1750, Brutton promoted not bare knuckle bouts at his amphitheatre near Marleybone Fields, including Battles Royale, in which a champion took on up to seven challenges at a time. The fights took place on an unfenced stage with several rows, several rows of seating for gentlemen. These rows were separated from the platform by a gap where the other spectators stood, their eyes level with the prejudice feet. Now, this is rather interesting because now we're going to get to the part that I really want to speak about. But before we get there, we can actually just have a look at the rules that were introduced by John Brock. So seven rules to be specific. And as you can see them, let me adjust the camera again. You can see them there. Those are the seven rules that he introduced. If you count, you can see that that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the seven rules were introduced by John Bratton. All right, zoom out a little bit. We focus a bit, then we can keep on reading. Here we are. Okay, and it says, Broughton capitalized on the popularity of prize fighting with the upper classes by offering tuition for persons of quality and distinction as a school in the hay market. Now, it's important that you take note of what he's saying there. Persons of quality and distinction, all right? It's almost like trying to open a high-class gym like we would today, however, the impact of that is a trickle-down effect, and that's what I want to demonstrate, or this is what we want to talk about, not demonstrate, because I'm not really, we're just having a conversation here. All right? What was offered from prize fighting in many respects, the exclusion of women, the absence of gambling, and the lack of police intervention. The most important difference, however, was the style of fighting involved, and in particular, the introduction of large, padded gloves or mufflers. So as a consequence of trying to get these persons of quality and distinction, and remember, we're talking about men of quality and distinction because he's already talked about the uh, exclusion of women, the absence of gambling, and the lack of police intervention. So, you know, <laughs> you know it's kind of really high class, you know what I'm saying? For those days anyway. He also introduced gloves, and the reason why he introduced gloves will become clear in a minute as we read on. Okay, the most important difference, however, was the style of fighting involved, and in particular, the introduction of large padded gloves or mufflers. Broughton, Broughton's advertisement 
promised in order that persons of quality and distinction may not be debarred from entering a course of those lectures. Okay. Let's go up. Let's see whether we can tilt it forward a little bit. Yes, get better. They will be given the utmost tenderness the utmost tenderness for which reason mufflers are provided that will effectively secure them for the inconveniency of black eyes, broken jaws and bloody noses. So the gloves were initially introduced sort of separating these type of people from the sort of bare knuckle fights that you got, uh, you know what I mean, prior to uh, John Broughton opening his Amphitheatre. Another person actually opened the uh, amphitheatre prior to John Brosnan, I believe, but I've forgotten his name. I think his name was Stokes. I think his name was Stokes. However, that's by the by. I think it was John Brosnan who wrote the rules and decided to take boxing to another level before the the Queens, the Marquis of Queenbury rules came in in the 1860s, as stated before. By this time, we're talking about what was then known as sparring, which could be differentiated from boxing again. And he talks about this because it, is, it speaks specifically about sparring with mufflers. Was different enough from bare knuckle prize fighting to be deemed a separate sport, albeit one that was sorry, parasitic on the rough glamour of its ancestor. The journalist Pierce Egan described sparring as a mock encounter, but at the same time a representation, and in most cases an exact one, of real fighting, which of course remained the platonic form. Whether or not he attended prize fights, a modern urban gentleman who exercised gently with his padded gloves could believe himself in touch with an older and somehow more sorry, more aesthetic, authentic, not aesthetic, authentic England. I don't know why I said that. Authentic England. That kind of spoiled it for me because I was going to read it perfectly, but I don't know. But anyway, as you can see, I'll leave it there.